Welcome. I'm very pleased today to welcome you to the Center for Literary and Comparative Studies at the University of Maryland. I'm Tita Chico, Professor of English and Faculty Director of the Center. The Center convenes this year-long series on anti-racism to act on statements of solidarity for Black Lives Matter issued by the college, the university, and especially by the department. Black Lives Matter. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Jacob Blake, Daniel Prude. Black Lives Matter. With this series, we also celebrate the memory of 2nd Lieutenant Richard Collins III, a young Black man who was murdered uh, uh, on campus in May 20, on May 20th, 2017, by white supremacist. Lieutenant Richard Collins III was with friends right before he was about to graduate from Bowie State University. Black Lives Matter. To be clear, in this series, anti-racism is the intellectual starting point for humanistic literary inquiry. It is not an add-on. Anti-racism is likewise a practice to help us push beyond the inadequacies of diversity and inclusion. As my colleague, Professor Zita C. Nunez writes, this is not the time, if ever there was a time, for shifting over a bit to make room, for being the one to allow others to speak, for making promises. This is the time for remaking, for asking who we are. We are meeting today grounded by our institutional home, the University of Maryland, which is just 10 miles away from Capitol Hill. The university grounds, though, are on the original homelands of the Anacostan and Piscataway tribal nations. In Washington, DC, it is home to a football team named until very recently with a racial slur. With this series, we also honor and highlight the long-standing commitment among many English department faculty and students to anti-racist scholarship and teaching. We are in the very, very special position of welcoming back two such faculty members of the department, Nicole King and Candace Chu, who will discuss Dr. King's work on fictions of Black childhood. Following the not guilty verdict for George Zimmerman, who murdered Trayvon Martin, Martin, an unarmed black teenager, Trayvon Martin's mother registered the shock that the jury did not see her son as the adolescent he was, that the jury did not see him, in her words, as their son. As Jacob Breslow explains, Trayvon Martin's mother is articulating this long history of the lack of justice that Trayvon Martin and his family received. And that history is one in which the protective confines of child, its childhood itself disintegrates for Black children. What then might fictions of Black childhood help us, in the words of Candace Chu, to imagine otherwise? How, as Nicole King's scholarship urges us to do, might we see fictions of Black childhood as spaces of dissent, resistance, and renewal, pointing a way forward to a more equitable anti-racist future? The Center's anti-racism series is co-sponsored by the University Libraries, the Graduate School's Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and the Petru Foundation. With this support, we are able to commit to making these events accessible with live captioning, and you'll find the TypeWell link in the uh, chat window. I wanna thank Danielle Griffin and Liam Daly, the graduate assistants who work for the center, and to thank very specially Dr. Karen Nelson, co-director of the center and director of research initiatives for the department. Our program will be an hour, our guests will be in conversation with each other for 30 minutes, after which my colleague, Bill Cohen, will come back to moderate the Q&A. And a final word today. Today, I am so utterly honored to be in the presence of these three luminous, brilliant, generous scholars, 
scholars who have meant so much to me for a very long time. So much so that when I write, when I read, I hear their voices, taking in all of our conversations and how they make my own work and my own life so much better. Now, I ask that you please join me in welcoming Nicole King and Candace Chu for Fictions of Black Childhood. Thank you, Tita. Thank you so much. Uh, it's just a fantastic feeling to be here with you and the gathered audience that I cannot yet see, but of course with Candace and, and Bill as well. Um, I, I don't even I don't even know where to begin. So I just want to let the audience know that um, this is this is a wonderful uh, return in homecoming. Um, I started out my academic career with uh, Bill Cohen, who will be moderating our conversation, and was quickly joined uh, by Candace, and have since become uh, good friends and intellectual partners as well with Tita Chico. So this is uh, Candace and I are going to try to resist just sort of hanging out and having a, a good old catch up and, and try to keep on target. Candace. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Thank you all very much. Um, I am putting into the chat just information about my backdrop. Um, Huge thanks to Tita and to Bill and to Karen Nelson and Danielle and Liam and Nicole always um, and all of you who are joining us for this hour. <clears throat> this really is just a tremendous um, joy and pleasure and you know Tita thank you for, for organizing this for us. Um, especially since mid-March when we began this intense period of virtual mediation I've begun regularly to use a practice of what I think of as place setting or place making. So I'm, I'm doing a little bit of reading because I didn't want to um, take up too much time with this, but um, the rest of the conversation will be much less scripted. So um, inspired by something Alexis Pauline Gums did at an American Studies Association conference a few years ago. Um, namely, that's to ask at the beginning of seminars and other kinds of meetings and events such as this one, to pause for a moment and deliberately remember the people who are always with us, even in their absence, the people we bring into the space with us. This is for me often my teachers, both formal and informal, as well as students, past, current, and future. And in this way, I invoke all the people who made and make it possible for me to be in this particular place and time. I'm struck by the fact that Tita, Bill, and Nicole are among those who are always with me, and distinctly so in academic arenas, as I learned and continue to learn how to work with ideas and to work with people committed also to working with ideas in their company. This practice is also a way, though, to remember everyone who made us possible, not only the people known to us, but the many, many who are unknown and yet so vitally a condition of possibility. For me, here in New Jersey, that includes the Leni Lenape peoples who continue to fight for sovereignty against the U.S. settler state. They are also always in the room with me and with us. Each of us, in this sense, is a crowd. So if you would take a moment to remember deliberately all the people to whom we are accountable and responsible and who made and make us in this conversation possible, we can in this way remember the thickness of the present, even in this virtually mediated and dispersed way. I'm so looking forward to the day when the four of us and all of us actually can be back in the same room together. But in the meantime, <clears throat> this is particularly appropriate um, for me, um, uh, particularly appropriate to this return to the University of Maryland, but it's also very much related to some of the things I've been thinking about in preparing for this conversation that come of thinking black childhood um, in Nicole's company and through the work that she's undertaken in her current research which has in part to do with rendering available forms of relationality and knowing incommensurate to those demanded by racial capitalism and its specific manifestation as anti-blackness. So I'll stop there for now and I'm gonna turn it back to Nicole, um, noting in the process that we decided in preparing for today um, to do a little bit of scripting um, and uh, to identify three things that each of us wanted to make sure to put into the conversation, um, even in a fairly flat-footed way, which is a section that's going to come now, um, so as to try to avoid the regret of not having said certain things in the aftermath of today's event. Um, so then Nicole will share her three things, and then I will, and then we'll open to a broader arranging conversation. Um, so I'll end right now just by um, reiterating just a huge amount of gratitude and affection for everyone here, um, both 
everyone present in this conversation, but also just here with us. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Candice. Um, I just, I should also say that I'm, I'm coming to you all and I'm returning to Maryland, as it were, from um, Southeast London. Uh, and I hope that there are some people from this side of the pond on, on, in, in the meeting as well. Um, and I think we'll get to that in our conversation, this sort of different, different locations. But being differently located, I'm, I'm originally from um, New York City, from Manhattan. Um, I've lived in London a very long time now, uh, but have maintained uh, my relationship with, with, uh, with Tita and Candace and, and Bill and even uh, deepened it um, despite, despite this distance. Um, but yes, location is one of the things. But my three things that I wanted to make sure, or, or I wanted to invite the audience to think about as, as we're talking, and I think this, these three things will undergird some of, some of what we're talking about. I'm writing a book and in the process of, of, of finishing it about representations of uh, black childhood in African-American literature. And in the book, as books go, I'm, I'm, it's bounded. So I'm really just looking at the mid 20th century to the end of the 20th century. But as Tita's um, very moving introduction to today's session uh, highlighted, uh, ideas of black childhood and, and when we think of anti-racist pedagogy, um, they're very, very present in our, um, in our contemporary world, in the second decade of, of the 21st century. So one thing I want us to be thinking about is, is what does it mean to actually see black children um, and attend to their complexity? Um, what does it mean to observe in detail the, the contours of their childhoods? And really what, this is still one question, <laughs> what does it mean to, or, or, or how might that, that looking, that attention, uh, be subversive, uh, be working against what uh, so much of the larger American culture is urging us not to do. Um, I think that leads to, certainly leads to in my work, uh, how, how and in what context can we begin a conversation about uh, black children in agency. And there are, opportunities and pitfalls in that notion of agency in as much as uh, sociological, there's, there's been educational and socio sociological research um, that situates black children in a very precarious position whereby um, institutions, like educational institutions, law enforcement institutions always see black children or detrimentally see black children as older uh, than they are and potentially as having more agency than their white peers might have. So, so very, in, my, in my discussions, I end, you know, sort of literary discussions, agency, when I talk, when I talk about agency, I, I see that as, as an opportunity, but I'm very much aware that, that uh, it is also a liability um, for, for, for black children. But how and in what context can we begin a conversation about black children and, and agency? Um, and finally, um, just thinking about my, my our, all of us are, 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 are literary and cultural uh, scholars, um, but, but what do we learn from the representation of Black childhood in the literature? Um, because there, you know, it is there that we have uh, so many possibilities um, uh, that, that the imagina imaginative um, uh, uh, universe that, that so many authors have, uh, have given us. Um, I see childhood as central to the themes as well as the narratives of 20th century American fiction and prior to the 20th century and after the 20th century. But in that literature, we see uh, childhood being celebrated, protected, um, uh, and, and just generally witnessed. So what can we learn in the sense of pedagogy? What can we learn from, from the literature itself. So those are, those are the sort of broad themes that um, I'll probably return to as, as Candace and I continue to, to talk this out. Well, it's, it's quite, it's late afternoon for me. I, I, I know it's early afternoon for you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, 
I suppose it's not at all surprising that there's overlap between the three things that you were talking about and the three things that um, I wanted to make sure. Um, but in uh, maybe just in, in different idioms, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the first thing and the, the three things are related for me as well. And one is, and I think again, this picks up both from Tita's um, introduction, but also Nicole from not only what you said, but also the, the project itself. One is thinking about the horizons of the work that we're doing, right? So mm -hmm. really to remember that a conversation about the fictions of Black childhood um, has as its horizon world making, you know, um, world making toward the ends of the end of racial capitalism, the end of coloniality. Um, so really always to bear in mind for us and for this conversation um, that the intellectual and critical work of focusing on Black childhood is a practice of anti-racism. Right, um, and exactly the ways that you were already framing it, um, to study in detail the contours of a subject that is subordinated um, literally by police, right, but also in kind of intellectual traditions as well. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, and again, relatedly, and I'm, I'm borrowing here from Laura Kang's uh, most recent um, book, Traffic in Asian Women, and, and drawing forward the work that Nicole is doing in her current research, um, which I think is also to conceive of Black childhood as method, right? Um, so mm -hmm. not as a st static object to be revealed and known in a hard and fast way that, you know, here's the truth about Black children, um, but instead as a way of understanding how the world organizes and often, too often, disorganizes life and being um, to give potency and meaning to Black childhood. Um, so Black childhood as method or as analytic category, um, more so than as a static object of study. Um, and then third and finally, and you know, I know that this is obvious, but and again, this, this picks up, I think, Nicole, and what you were saying already, um, but I, I want to keep repeating it, is that, that the, the meaning of Black childhood is as much about joy and life and joyful life as it is about the address of anti-Blackness, as it is about murder and, and violence and, and uh, a kind of decimated, decimated childhood in some ways. Um, or in other words, to try to think of this as, you know, the problem of Black childhood is, is or the, the structural ways in which some children are racialized as Black through the systematic withholding and removal of support and resources, right, is white supremacy, right? It's, it's not a function of blackness, it's actually a function of white supremacy. So the focus on black childhood as a way of addressing um, what we might, following Sylvia Winter and Catherine McKittrick, think of as the over-representation of whiteness mm -hmm. rather than the under-representation of something else, right? So really always targeting white supremacy and whiteness as the problems here. Um, and I've been thinking about that in part, and this is perhaps part of the pivot in thinking about us having this conversation in an academic setting, um, though I'm standing in my house in, in suburban New Jersey saying that, but this, this academic, virtual academic setting um, is that, you know, all of us, I think, uh, or many of us, but certainly all of us in terms of panelists have, have worked on these diversity, equity, inclusion projects, right? Um, and I keep hearing that language of the underrepresentation. you know, we need to think about the underrepresentation of minorities. It's like, actually, what if we think of the overrepresentation of whiteness, right? What is that shift in our thinking about what the problem is that we're trying to address in the institution? Um, so there's something here that I'm trying to get at that it's about the importance of naming the problem correctly or more correctly. Um, that feels a piece with the kind of work that you're doing in this project, right? Really mm -hmm. emphasizing a kind of um, double layer, you know, of what comes, of the, the sort of knowledge that comes of focusing on Black childhood um, and using that as a centerpiece um, of, of intellectual work. Um, okay, so those are my three things. So then we can pivot from there really to sinking in a little bit more specifically, maybe um, beginning with where, where you started, Nicole, kind of identifying that you're in London, right? And so mm -hmm. we all met each other in Maryland um, at the University of Maryland, just outside of DC. Um, you subsequently went to San Diego um, and lived there for several years. And then you subsequently moved again. Um, your roots are in New, New York City, right? Um, to, what are the, how, how should we understand how it is that your um, focus on Black childhood um, is related to those kinds of locations and maybe the, the differences in the locations? You know, what, what's the specificity of that for you? I think 
Well, first of all, I just want to say this is why um, I'm so grateful to be here because I turn my work over to people like Candace and Tita and Bill, and they, they just tell me what it's actually about and put it so beautifully. Um, it always is invigorating and exciting. Um, so I encourage everyone to find yourself some friends like these and some colleagues like these because they're, they're just the best. I think my, my uh, peripatetic life, shall we say, um, has had a lot to do with with the sort of specificity of the focus of, of this of this book, I mean, I, I, um, I, I think there's a sort of way in which this is very much my home, and this is certainly the place where I, I have most fully inhabited the role of um, raising a child. Uh, and it, that is, London has been that place, but but because of that, um, you know, I've just sort of been very uh, perhaps more aware of um, my New York roots and, you know, creating a sense of New Yorkerness from my, my, my London, South London accented young man, um, who's now 18. Uh, I, I, think, I think that, I, I, I guess what I want to get out first is that uh, there's a lot to say about representations of Black childhood um, in British contexts, in Caribbean contexts, uh, that that enter my work or will enter my work um, or be developed in subsequent work. And I hope we can, we can talk about that as well. But I think in particular for the text that I'm looking at, one of the ways in which we can understand the complexity of ch black childhood and see the complexity of black childhood is to understand the, the, what happens through movement, right? What happens through migration and journeys. Uh, for literary people, you know, we're really comfortable with that, with the Bildungsroman form, right? The, the journey, the narrative of development, uh, the, the young protagonist goes on a journey, um, you know, childhood, adolescence, and the, and the end point, right, is, is adulthood. And for me, that journey is very uh, significant, um, but, it, but really wanting to pause and to um, understand for instance, uh, what does it mean for someone like Selena Boyce in um, uh, Paul Marshall's 1959 novel, Brown Girl, Brown Stones? She's in Brooklyn. Uh, her parents are migrants from, from uh, Barbados. And she has a very different childhood from, from her mother and her father. But her mother and father, who are both from Barbados, themselves have almost divergent childhoods. Um, so within this one family, there are three very, very different ways of understanding quote unquote black childhood. So for me, that sort of uh, perhaps overdetermining aspect of movement in my own life has become a template to remind me to really attend quite carefully to the locations of blackness in these texts and, and, and therefore to listen and to hear what the texts are telling us. And I think that what they're telling us, I mean, Selena is just, you know, a wonderful, wonderful character. Um, but she, she becomes instructive to us, right? She takes those strands of both parents' um, experiences, uh, which, you know, you could very simplistically oppose, you know, sort of uh, as oppressed and free loving. I mean, but, but that's silly, but more what she does is, is that sort of power and self-determination that she sees her mother exercising and her father um, grasping at literally the joyfulness of, of, of his boyhood. And she's saying, this is, this is, this is what has shaped me. Um, and I think that, I'll, I'll stop because obviously I could go on and on and on, but that's where for me, my sort of peripatetic movement, my understanding of what it's like to raise a young, uh, a black boy in London, uh, you know, not to mention just the oddness of a boy, <laughs> because I had, I had a sister, didn't know anything about boys in that sense, um, uh, away from away from my childhood in, in New York um, and, and how all of that has, has created something else. So I, they, I'm not saying, I'm, I hope I'm not that solipsistic in my, in my scholarship that it's just what I have experienced and I'll, I go and look for that, <laughs> for evidence of that in the novels, but I hope that answers that question. I think so. And I, I think, I mean, 
I don't think it's at all solipsistic, but I also think that there is something about, um, you know, part of what you're talking about, right, is the ways that our, the intellectual work that we do can't but be shaped by the corporeal knowledge we bring to bear. So when those bodies are made to move, they reorganize themselves into different bodies. So that's one thing. And then the other thing I think is actually, I mean, you know, there's something about what you were saying um, that was really making me think about how we're still working to return heterogeneity to these uh, uh, subject positions or to these categories, right? Um, so that there isn't a singular Black childhood. There isn't a singular way of understanding Blackness, right? And, you know, again, it's like stating the obvious, but, we, but, but it's, a, it's a necessary obvious in some way, right? It's like we have to keep, keep repeating it. Um, but to repeat it in this way that provides texture, I mean, quite literally in the ways that you are working with texts and to provide this kind of, um, you know, the, the, there's just a lot, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of writing that writes through and with the figure of the black child. And I think that there is something about um, the differences across those that is part of what you're bringing to bear. And that those differences are related to the kind of geo, geo historical specificities of where these figures are, are located. So, so maybe that's also a way of asking you, um, I wonder if you would talk a little about, you know, some of the like the earliest figures that you bring to mind. And I know you and I have, um, have you know, made mention of Frederick Douglass and Harriet Jacobs, um, and then kind of thinking about the contemporary resonances and what it is I mean, there's so much attention right now to black youth, right? And to, you know, the centrality of black um, youth and black queer women um, who are at the center of so much political and social activism right now. Um, how we can think about black childhood in relation to this other category of black youth, which tends to be a little bit older, right? Tends to skew a little bit older, I think, than perhaps some of the characters you're working with. Well, that sort of definition of childhood is 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 a place is 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 fraught, right? Well, who who is a child? When does childhood begin? When does childhood end? Um, and in, in in literary terms, you know, we we can we can stretch that rubber band <laughs> as far as we like, really. Um, you know, to a certain extent, writes bigger Thomas is is very much an adolescent um, when we meet him, but I think technically in the text he's he's twenty. Um, uh, uh, but yes, let's just let's just let's just name in a more specific way um, Frederick Douglass and and uh, Harriet Jacobs. Uh, and I I was saying to Candace, well I wasn't saying because we didn't I don't think we I think we emailed about what we might talk about. Um, and you know Frederick Douglass is very apropos in terms of in terms of Maryland. Um, but I just. You know, we when we teach that text, the 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 first um, the first autobiography. You know, the key the key scene there is his is his uh, fight with uh, with Covey, right? You know, how a slave is uh, made a man. Um, that extraordinary biblical, um, you know, moment of, of 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 coming into his sense of himself. I'm sorry, the one that I love is when he's tricking those white boys on the docks of Baltimore into teaching him how to read. <laughs> you know, um, when who is it? When, when all, what's her name? Mrs. Ald, you know, is told, yeah, teach him how to read. And he figures out, right? And so that to me is this wonderful moment at the heart of sort of the African American literary tradition of um, the agency of the black child. Um, and of course, we can contextualize that in the sense that he has to live by his wits. Um, but, but for me, that, that sort of juxtaposition of two sets of childhoods, right? Um, and we, and that, I think that fades away because, of course, we're, you know, this narrative is being told retrospectively and we know all of the amazing things that Frederick Douglass does as an adult. Um, but that, to me, is central to that text because, of course, we wouldn't have had the text. We wouldn't have had Frederick Douglass, really, if he didn't learn how to read. Right. And he, 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 he does that. Um, and then Harriet, and, and, and that sense of, you know, well, we can have a, a whole another session on, on that. But Harriet Jacobs as well is, is a girl, is a teenager, um, is an adolescent um, who must use her wits and not, not in isolation. She is, she's, just as we know, Frederick Douglass wasn't isolated from his community, but she must use her wits to outwit 
her, you know, the sexual predator that is the person who owns her. Um, and, you know, Phyllis Wheatley is a teenager when she is writing her poetry, if we go back, uh, you know, to, to the 18th century. Um, I think when we, when we, so it's there that sort of genealogy is in, in the literature and I'd, I'd like to, I want to sort of name check two um, other Maryland people. So, so uh, uh, an alum of, of this, of the English department, Nazira Sadiq Wright, has written this lovely, really erudite book about black girlhood in the, in the 19th century and really is uh, opening up that genealogy for, for the scholarship. Um, and I'm very grateful for her, for her work. Um, but another um, former colleague of ours, uh, Reginald McKnight, one of his stories is a story that I deal with and it really gets at that sort of over-determination of whiteness that you were talking about, Candace. So it's, it's in a collection called um, White Boys and the story itself is called The White Boys. Um, and it puts side by side, it's a, it, a you know, a, a young, a, I don't know, maybe 12 year old boys, white boy and a black boy who are neighbors. And I'm not going to give anything else, give anything away, because I want everybody to go find, find these books and read them and buy them. Um, but you see that sort of learning of racialization is not a black thing. That white, the, you know, Garrett, the white boy, is also being taught what whiteness is and what whiteness is in relationship um, to blackness. And whiteness is, is violence, right? Whiteness in the way in which he's being taught it is about terrorizing. Um, the black child, the black friend. Um, and these boys resist that. They resist it in a heartbreaking um, fashion. But what McKnight's work really brought to the fore for me, that's like one of the earliest texts, I thought, I didn't know how. I mean, this is, this is from the 1990s, and I always knew that I wanted to write about that text, and I didn't really know how or why I was going to write about it until this book over the years took shape. And it is that sense of... Um, uh, how children teach each other, what they teach each other, not always good, but often very, very good, often very, very subversive, often really rejecting that um, structure that the adult world is trying to impose on them. And that is the link to the now. Um, and I, and I, think, I think what we're seeing in public life, um, particularly in the US, but also in the UK, um, are, are, are young people, you know, whether they're 12 or 16 or 18, um, taking, taking that uh, uh, responsibility for themselves, uh, for shaping their world and how, they, and how they're going to see the world. And I think the, 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 one of the effects of that is that we are forced to understand, wow, these are, these are, these are not adults in waiting. Right? These are not adults in formation. These are people who are fully of themselves right now and are demanding that we understand that and, and that we see that. Um, and I think we also, I, you know, I'm, I, sometimes I feel it's old fashioned almost to work on literature, but um, that's where, that's what I do. But there's so many films right now. I mean, Netflix people, there's so many films that are centering black girlhood. Um, uh, Cuties and um, Rocks, which is set in, in London. Cuties is set in Paris. So this is, despite the focus of my text, the sense of let us understand and engage with this complexity is very much of, of, of the moment um, right now across various media, across various um, locations. I think there's something, I mean, there, there's a bunch of things. Um, uh, I think there's something about what you're saying that's really making me think, you know, this is one of the um, kind of topics that we had identified as possible, but as thinking that question, who gets to figure the future, right? And, and who is doing the figuring? And there is a way that part of what you're suggesting, not only um, in the world that we're living in right now, but actually through these long, long histories of literature, right? The literary tradition, um, African-American literary tradition that we actually see the figuration of the black child as a future, mm -hmm. um, claiming that position for him and herself, right? Mm -hmm. So that they're not waiting, they're not waiting for that adjudication by somebody else, but actually that image of um, Frederick Douglass, uh, tr you know, 
uh, being crafty, right? Figuring out what he needs and figuring out how he's going to be the person who narrates for us. Um, there, there is something about that that I think is really powerful against the spectacularized um, scene of violence, right? Against the spectacularized you know, um, anti-blackness that is so much present. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say, which actually I think I have to bookmark because I don't, I don't know where to take this further, but it's, it's when you were talking about Bigger Thomas, actually, right? And that question of stretching childhood, um, you know, there's another question of like who gets to be a child, right? And all of the associated mm -hmm. uh, kind of pleasures and, you know, whatever forms of innocence we associate with that, but, and for how long, right? But also, so within that, I think there's something about a theory of time or a theory of temporality that's hovering in there, right? So Bigger Thomas appearing as a 20 year old, but who is actually very much an adolescent, right? Um, it's a different way of thinking time than Tavi Nyong'o or Deepesh Chakrabarti has you know, mm -hmm. talked about as kind of the waiting room of history. There's something else happening. There's not a waiting, right? There's something else that's happening there. So. there there's something else that, hap that happens, and we just have to say this even again, though it may sound um, obvious. Uh, when, we, when we think about black childhood and when we sort of want to place a claim on that. This, I don't know if it's flip side or not, but it is the way in which black adults, right, are not allowed maturity, right, that, 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 uh, that they, they are continually um, uh, reduced to, uh, you know, being called boy, right, or, or um, you know, we've got a good girl uh, cleaning our house, right, that that, that, that um, adulthood is actually denied them at the same time that black children are pushed into um, and presumed to already have um, extraordinary maturity, whether that is um, sexual maturity or taking care of themselves, um, you know, which a Frederick Douglass narrative obviously plays into, you know, the sui genre sort of, uh, sui genre sort of thing. Um, but but um, uh, uh, Robin Bernstein's uh, racial innocence, uh, she, she, she hits on that e immediately um, as the, 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 the denial of innocence from the black child is uh, uh, part and parcel of the denial of agency and adulthood for the black, for the black adult. And Bigger is a really interesting. I don't. I don't talk about Bigger, but you, you know, you can't really talk about twentieth century African American literature and not at least mention him um, alongside Pakola Breedlove in, in *The Bluest Eye*. But he is immature, but he also has to take care of his family, right? Assist his mother in providing for it for his family. So, I, it, you know, there there are that is those are the complications, right? Um, and for the, I think I think for the I think Selena Boyce actually is is about twenty by the end of the text. It's just that most of the text, you know, she's between ten and ten and sixteen, and and so that's that's really really helpful. Um, and that's the way in which in which I've organized it. But yeah, the the way in which adult I think you started out by asking who gets to figure the future, um, and that is that is that is tricky. Ground and I think in literature we have we have so much room for maneuver. Um, we have we have unreliable narrators. We have flashback. We have retrospective narration. Um, uh, lots and lots of ways of figuring that child and thinking through the future. But in our world, in our contemporary 2020 um, crazy world, um, that sense of I'm going to help shape this future that we are seeing um, uh, the way in which black children are taking uh, and black young people are taking that platform. I think actually that also has a, a long history um, in, in the United States, uh, at least in the United States. But you know, the Children's March um, leading up to the March on Washington, um, the way in which uh, Du Bois and Jesse Fawcett understand uh, uh, black children as, as being actually quite strategic as, as uh, 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 helping, helping with that uplift ideology and so that they use the brownies, um, their, their, their youth publication of, of the crisis in the 1920s to specifically speak to children and in that way ha have children speaking back to adults. You know, that's the sort of, um, uh, uh, anyway, yeah. 
Um, I we can keep going with that, Tita. I don't know at what point we shift into Q and A. Well, how about how about this? Where I'll invite folks to pose their questions in the Q and A, um, and I'll turn the the the, the Q over to Bill, and maybe he can kind of pose the that that last question you guys were thinking about as a way to kind of continue. Does that sound good? Well, and, and then in the meantime, then I could actually, while people are thinking, um, I didn't know how far I should keep going in, in, the, in the direction that we were going, but, um, you know, I wonder, Nicole, if you would talk through a little about how innocence plays out across these texts, or maybe just pick one or two, because it does seem like that that, that is a hovering sort of not an issue, but but something that hovers around the idea of childhood and um, the ways that um, we've already begun thinking or talking about black childhood, um, both as a kind of as a, a, a figure, right, but also as a as a condition, you know, um, a social condition, and um, not so much thinking about you know the. I almost want to say like just sort of the easy association of or the easy withholding of innocence from black childhood, but rather the complicatedness of the question of innocence within mm -hmm. a field where um, uh, anti-black racism exists as a crafting mechanism, you know, as part of what it means to have meaning for the idea of the black child, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, does that make sense? Dangerous, right? Innocence is dangerous. Um, I, I think, I think, I think that's, if you're innocent, you're not aware, right, of how you exist in the world as a racialized subject and, and what the consequences of being racialized as black means. You're vulnerable. Um, you're absolutely vulnerable. Um, on the other hand, I think, We see, we see that all the time in the literature. We see, we see that sense of, um, you know, that is a sort of a pedagogical imperative of black childhood is to understand, to learn how to negotiate the world. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is Du Boisian double consciousness. This is part of that talk, right? That black parents the, um, in, in, in uh, majority white communities have with their, with their, with their children. I think though, you know, we, 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 we also have black parenthood. You, you can't talk about black childhood without talking about black adulthood. You can't talk about black childhood without talking about black, black parenthood. Um, you know, can't talk about African-American literature without talking about Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison has those protective parents all throughout her literature. But she also has that, that joyfulness of, of, of childhood, you know, and, Sula is one of my favorite texts. I mean, you know, obviously we have Beloved and we have, you know, the, I would rather my baby die and I will, I will be the one who, who does that rather than this baby live the life of, of an enslaved person. We have that in Beloved, but way before that in, um, certainly in Sula, you know, Sula and now my favorite line, we was girls together. And we get a very clear sense of what that, you know, it's not an unfraught friendship. Um, we have the craziness of the Deweys, you know, in, in, in Sula, but also in, in, in The Bluest Eye. Uh, there is the traumatized, uh, brutalized Pecola, Pecola Breedlove. Um, and this is an, she is a character, once you read her, you can never forget. But Morrison also gives us, from the very first, as our narrator, Claudia McTeer, right? And Claudia you know, we, in our, in our um, pre-conversations, we were talking about how childhood really um, punctuates uh, African Ameri or American history. And so Brown versus Board of Education is perhaps for the 20th century, the key legislation, the you know, desegregation of, of, of public um, schools. One in part, right, by the, the Dahl study, um, Claudia McTeer in, uh, in The Bluest Eye is given this doll. And uh, Robin Bernstein writes so beautifully about this. She says, you know, 
Claudia knows that she's supposed to love this doll. She knows she's supposed to cherish this doll because it's a white doll with blonde hair and blue eyes. And that's what people do with those type of dolls. She doesn't want that. She just, <laughs> she wants to decapitate it and take the eyes out and, you know, because this is, this is poisonous, really, uh, uh, and not her idea of fun whatsoever. Um, so there's not, this is perhaps is veering from your question around, you know, how is innocence figured, but in, innocence is, is, is dangerous, but at the same time, there is uh, this uh, uh, um, kidness, what I call kidness. We see, we see black kids being kids in, in, in the literature, whereas in the public discourse, uh, I, I think we are pretty much overwhelmed um, by the abjectness uh, of, of the black child and by the violence enacted against the black child. And this is where, as you said of just a few moments ago, you know, what, has, what, what, what young women and young men are doing right now is, is, is really quite wonderful. There's something to me there about how, you know, revisiting these literatures, really thinking about this through line, right, of the figuration of Black childhood and of Black children, right, the figuration of Black children. There's something there about really rewriting the terms of what constitutes the possibility of justice, what con right? Mm -hmm. So if, you know, given that innocence is never a, uh, an unfraught category, right? Um, and uh, certainly in, in the US context, but probably globally as well, I, you know, there's there's so much attention now to abolitionist discourses, right? With Wilson Gilmore mm -hmm. here, um, certainly is part of that. And um, the kind of really strong attention that has been paid to the problem of innocence as, uh, innocence as a problem for the, car um, that, that kind of perpetuates the, the carceral state, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that there's something in these literatures that might help us understand not only that, like that innocence is a problem, but also maybe crafts the possibility for thinking otherwise, right? For actually imagining what does something like justice, something like, you know, um, joy or life or whatever it is, you know, the contrasting terms, what does that look like and feel like and how do you inhabit that? Um, that doesn't have the kind of moralizing categories of the, of the present, right, of the racial capitalist. Mm. There is something you said, though, um, or wrote to me that I just thought was so, so appropriate in, in, in again, getting back to the sense of, of pedagogy and what do we see when we look at Black children. And you had said, Candace, that you know, in, in the way in which we don't see black children or the way in which we are tra un, we're trained against seeing black children as children, you know, perhaps, you know, excluding black children from that realm of, of, of innocence and kidness, mm -hmm. literally training us not to see black adults as human, mm -hmm. right? Is, is literally laying the groundwork for the brutalization of all black bodies. Um, but, but particularly, um, well, not particularly, but you know what I'm, what I'm saying. You know, it makes possible um, that, that sort of racial terror um, in, in, in adult life and in the in juridical life, right? In, in, in various um, uh, discourses of, 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 of law and order. Um, and I just thought that was, that was not a way in which I had been thinking about, about this before, that sort, of, um, that sort of register. And again, that the literature gives gives us all of all of that. And I think for, for I, I'm, I'm not at all um, suggesting that, well, obviously I'm not the first person to think about the figure of the African-American child in, in, in literature, um, but that that is, that is in the literature as well. That sort of training of um, whiteliness, right? How, how whiteness is, is going to um, police uh, adult as well as uh, juvenile black bodies. And I, so thank you for that point. So maybe I can jump in here and just say um, thank you so much for this incredibly captivating uh, conversation among two um, very dear colleagues. Um, and part of what's wonderful about um, the way in which the two of you uh, talk with each other is that you're both such um, incredible literary scholars and have such a deep and ingrained commitment to the literary as a, not just to literary text, but to really literary modes of analysis. And that is such a prevalent theme in the work of, of both of you and has been such an enduring interest and concern of yours. Um, 
and and so I want to go back into in, in one of the questions that's come up to um, something you talked about, which is the kind of literary the ways in which the literary um, enables certain kinds of learning or understanding and, and formation for children, especially to take place, both for us to witness it and for children as readers to consume it and and learn learn their own racialization. Um, and how you think about that now when maybe young people don't read as much or in the same ways um, and where the media that they experience and especially social media, of course, um, give them a different kind of purchase on both their understanding of their own childhood or themselves as children, their, their own sense of agency and particularly what it means to inhabit their blackness for, for black children in, in particular. And, and if you see that there's change, is there a possibility? Is it just more of the same kind of, uh, or even less so because of, the, of the, the lack of maybe literary nuance of unreliable narrators and uh, irony and all the things that we've learned to, to, um, from you to read in such complex and interesting ways in the literary texts. Nicole, you want to start? Yes, um, thank you, Bill. I, you know, it's interesting. This is this is something that, that Nicole and I touched upon. Um, actually, let me answer it in this way. We were actually talking about the um, curriculum, like at the level of curriculum, you know, in a K through 12 school, um, and whatever the K through 12 iteration is on the on the other side of the pond, as it were, um, and what they don't read. So, you know, my kids going through are still reading more or less the, the curriculum that I read coming to high school in northern New Jersey in the early 80s. Um, so Colby, who is my, my older child, as a, as a junior in his English class, had one book that was written by a non-white author actually one book that was written by a non-white man author um, and this was his junior you know honors english or whatever whatever class right so it's obviously this is not rep necessarily representative it's one school but it is a school it's a public school in an incredibly diverse and by every measure school district um 50 more than 50 percent of our student body um identifies as non-white more than 50 percent of the student body is um, available for school lunches, which is one way one way that they measure um, class differences, right, in our town. And so it was striking to me that here, um, which kind of cherishes this idea of multicultural diversity, we haven't gotten to a place where the curriculum itself has already changed. So what they, what, so oh, the overrepresentation of whiteness is a reality in so many ways, right, in, in all of these different ways. So that's a, that's a kind of roundabout way of answering to suggest that, you know, I think that they actually had more encounters with books that were featuring um, black characters, brown characters, and younger characters in the earlier years, right? So through the elementary school, through middle school, and it's actually when they start to become adults and, and we're giving them the knowledge that they're supposed to have now entering the world, that suddenly that all just goes away and what they're left with is a kind of terrain of the cultural landscape, right? So I, you know, there's some part of me that says like, oh, I want you to read more stuff, you know, <laughs> but I also think they're really good at I, and I don't think this is my kids, I think this is children generally, like they're good at reading the landscape, right? They're taking their cues in the ways that, um, you know, Nicole is talking about the kind of peer-to-peer -peer education. They're taking their cues in these lateral forms and these socially mediated forms. Some of what they learn, you know, I wish they could thicken it. And I think that that's part of what our job is now to provide some kind of thickness to the history that we're living right now. But I actually think that they have a huge amount of knowledge that they're, that they're um, taking from being able to read the stories that are out there in these very smart ways, in ways that I think are not being seduced by what they're supposed to think, but actually um, really reflect what they do think, you know, in this funny way. So I think, it, just partly to say, I think literariness can exist outside of literature. And I think that we can train people to be mindful of that outside of literature. I think also I wish that people would read more books. I mean, I, you know, just I do. And I think there's something about the stretching of time 
about the idea of getting inside of a world, about um, kind of reveling mm -hmm. in, and being able to look at the world from inside of this story. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that is a solid system. Like, that's how I see the world. And so I want other people to, to understand it that way. Well, you're, yeah. you're preaching to the choir here, so. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> um, but I, I also wanted to um, convey a question that uh, someone who's been a mentor to all of us, I think, Mary Helen Washington posed in the in the Q and A, um, and yeah. well, maybe you have thoughts about Mary Helen's question, which is how you think um, class bias affects Black children, and specifically how what she calls the the kind of Jack and Jill class hierarchy affects children who are ostracized by upper and middle class Black. So a question really about um, Blackness not as a unitary category, but one that is itself um, subdivided and sometimes internally in conflict. Well, I'm delighted to know Mary Helen is here. Um, uh, hi, Mary Helen. And, and one of the things, we haven't talked that much about class. We haven't really specified gender either, right? And the, and the sort of nuances and differences, absolute differences in terms of um, children who are figured as girls and who are figured as, as boys. But class, absolutely. Um, there is the othering that happens through the sort of representation of working class um, uh, child. And very often that is, that is the journey of development, right? That we have to leave behind that, those humble beginnings um, and, and make it. Um, and then with my students, you know, when I present to them uh, black children who are figured as middle class, let's say in, um, uh, Andrea Lee's work, that seems, they, that seems inauthentic to them, right? They're like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, they've got all this money, what? They've got a summer home, you know, Colson Whitehead's work, Sag Harbor, you know, so that there is that limitation of class that, that cuts across, um, uh, that the literature um, uh, uh, exposes and, and, and encourages us to think, to think through. Um, I think, it, there's this chapter where I'm, I'm writing about um, Brown Girl, Brown Stones and Dansky Senna's um, Caucasia. But I start it with this quote, the, I think it's the very first paragraph from, from Maud Martha, Gwendolyn Brooks's only novel. And that ordinary blackness is uh, uh, working class, ordinary blackness, but, but, but uh, for Maud, this is, these are jewels. These are, this is, um, uh, her backyard is a painting and, and, and she places herself in that painting. Um, and that sense of, again, this is where the literature really forces us, you know, if we're gonna read the literature carefully, um, we cannot have limited ideas of, of how, uh, how the black child is figured, but I, I work I, it, I work hard with, with with my students, some of who might be here, um, and they can attest to that. To, to be aware of those um, not just differences, but antagonisms of of, of class and difference within uh, uh, black communities. Very, really, really important question. Thank you. So um, that, that's actually a great segue to what I think will be the final question, um, which is a question really about teaching. And both of you are renowned teachers, and so I'm sure you've thought about this, but the question comes from a black instructor who teaches in a predominantly white institution and teaches a course on black childhood and, and reports that, it, that they find it spiritually draining, that work, and um, asks if you have thoughts or advice on teaching this material um, and especially on minimizing white fragility and highlighting joy. Oh, I wish we had more time. Um, I too teach in a, well, in a department that's predominantly white. And, um, uh, and I think, A, I think one of the things is to, to look at the archive of this particular um, series at University of Maryland, because um, there's some wonderful scholars who have talked about just this subject in some of the previous um, iterations. So that's that's the, the first thing. Um, there's a wealth of, of knowledge there. Um, and, and the other is, is um, setting ground rules in and, and referring to them and inviting the students themselves to help set those ground rules for how um, the, the class is, is going to um, proceed. And I just want to say that 
Candace and I very early, we were, I was trying to figure out what year it was, but maybe two or three years after um, uh, we were both at, at Maryland, we taught a class together on Asian American and African American literature. And that's really, that was so challenging to me, um, but so important in terms of having that teaching partner. And I learned so much from, from Candace. So I think the takeaway there is to have, um, to find a teaching partner, even if you're not teaching together, but someone to uh, share the, that draining part, right? Because if you don't let it out in some way, it's, it will, it will eat you, eat you, you know, be corrosive as it were. I don't really have anything to add to that, except that um, I think just to acknowledge that it's really hard, right? I mean, and, and it's a, you know, uh, I think the teaching partner thing is actually kind of brilliant and, and in this sort of expansive way, because in many ways, what I've been thinking about in terms of these forms of relationality or, you know, the long livedness of us as colleagues, um, thinking about collegiality as something that can sustain you through things that are just really hard. I remember that class actually as having its challenges because people were challenging our authority as young women of color in the front of the classroom and there were some, you know. We were young, we really we, were young. We were young, we were young, younger, we were younger. Um, it was the 1990s, it was yeah. the 1990s. So, you know, I mean, I think that there is something about making sure that you're connected with people beyond the classroom, maybe beyond your institution. Um, and mm -hmm. that feels really important since most of us teach, if you're teaching in a university in the United States or perhaps the UK, in predominantly white institutions, um, with the exception of HBCUs, with the exception of private colleges and Hispanic serving institutions. So, so there's that. And then I want to say something about like the, I don't know, the white fragility thing. Like, do we have to do that? Do we have to do that work? I'm not sure. I mean, I guess it's, it's not really an option, but it just, it's like people who want to fight anti-black racism by talking about white privilege and I'm kind of like I don't I don't know I that just doesn't seem right that it just keeps going back in that way so thinking the over representation of whiteness does not mean the recentering of whiteness in the fight against anti-racism and that uh, these are not particularly helpful strategies for pedagogy but maybe usefully kept in mind. I will tell you the one thing that maybe can help, and I, and I employ this in not, not necessarily the classroom, but, but in all sorts of circumstances where you have those experiences in it, and I think it's really crucial not to take it in, right? To actually um, have a kind of a shield or an armor around, around the sort of emotional taxing nature of that. Um, and it is to actually treat those circumstances as research laboratories. Right? Like, why do, why do certain subjects respond in a particular way to this and make that the point of entry uh, rather than necessarily responding to the reaction itself? So maybe that can provide a little bit of cushion. Thank you, Bill. I see that Bill has to sign off. To Thank go you, Bill. <laughs> And I want to, uh, we're, we're rounding out our hour and to end with the idea of relationality and we're in a crowd and um, find your people. I learned that long ago and I just try to find people who are smarter and better than I am and just let <laughs> on. <laughs> so um, I want to thank you, you so much. I want to thank Bill who had to, had to leave, who is such a integral part of of the fabric of all of us and Nicole and Candace. Um, thank you so much um, for everyone. This will be, uh, it's been recorded and it'll go up on, on our, our website. Um, and be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.